And an exponential, this is a linear graph, looks like a linear progression for a few years. Uh, you go out for a long period of time and the, the perspectives diverge quite radically and the, the further out you go, the more unrealistic a linear perspective becomes. And the ongoing exponential is made of a series of S-curves, each one representing a specific uh, paradigm. So if we look at, well, a personal experience, a computer that took up, it's about half the size of this room when I came to MIT in 65, uh, $11 million. It's about a thousand times less powerful than the computer in your cell phone today. But Moore's Law is really one example of many. It was the fifth paradigm to bring exponential growth to computing. This goes back to the lower left-hand corner, the first data processing equipment to automate an American census, use these old punch card machines. I think they were subsequently shipped to the Florida Election Commission. Uh, I'm, I'm going to leave out the rest of my jokes just to make the time frame here. But uh, Alan Turing created a relay-based computer that cracked the German Enigma code, then vacuum tubes were used in the 1950s. They were then shrinking vacuum tubes to make them smaller and smaller and to keep this exponential growth going. And that paradigm hit a wall. But, and that was the end of the shrinking of vacuum tubes. It was not the end of the exponential growth of computing. We went to another paradigm, transistors, which are not small tubes, and then to integrated circuits, which, so Moore's law, the shrinking of transistors and integrated circuit was the fifth paradigm to bring exponential growth. And there's been lots of projections that will hit a wall. The first projections were 2002. Intel now says, and the ITRS roadmap say 2022. By that time, the key features on conventional chips, using photolithography, just like today, four nanometer features, you'll be able to do strong AI based on the most conservative estimates of the amount of computation required for about $1,000. That's with no molecular computing. But molecular computing is working already. Uh, there are early versions due to hit the market. If you speak to Intel scientists, they're very confident of that particular paradigm. So we're not talking about any other exotic technologies. We can speculate what might happen after the singularity and go into things like quantum computing and PICO computing, but that's not really at issue here. Uh, we can even do it without molecular computing, but molecular computing is really, uh, that was somewhat speculative when we met seven years ago at the Spiritual Machines Conference. It's really very much a mainstream view today among the scientists working on that field. These are different computers. This is Hans Marvek's chart, same progression. Supercomputers marching along, Generally, my, my projections, even though they're considered in some quarters radical, end up very often being conservative. Uh, the, my book, which came out of, you know, half a year ago, projected 2013, it hit 10 to the 16th, calculations were second. Uh, Japan recently announced two supercomputer projects to hit that level by 2010. And I don't want to dwell on these in the interest of time, but this is the price of a transistor. Uh, you could buy a whole transistor for a dollar in 1968, and if you back up, so when I was hanging around the surplus electronic shops on Canal Street in New York in the 19, early 60s, I bought something this big for $40, equivalent to one transistor. It was a telephone relay with support circuitry, only very slow. Uh, and you then could buy a whole fast transistor for a dollar in 1968, 10 million in 2002, 100 million today. But look at how smooth this progression is. It looks like the output of some tabletop experiment. But this is the measure of worldwide activity involving millions of people. Now you might wonder, how could that be? How can you get such smooth and predictable curves uh, from the chaotic activity of lots of people when any specific project is very unpredictable? We see a similar phenomena in other areas of science like thermodynamics, the path of one particle in a gas is completely unpredictable, yet the overall gas made up of a large number of chaotically interacting particles has very predictable properties according to the laws of thermodynamics to a very high degree of precision. If you have a dynamic, chaotic system uh, where each element, each project, each technology project is unpredictable, the overall results will have certain predictable properties. And technology evolution, in fact, any process that is truly an evolutionary process is such a chaotic, dynamic system. And we see these smooth curves, and I say this now not just backfitting to past data, but making these forward-looking predictions for a long time. Uh, as the transistors have gotten smaller and cheaper, they've also gotten faster. So we've been doubling the price performance of electronics every, about every year. Uh, and the economists, that's 50% deflation. It's also true of other types of uh, information technology, net, genetic technology, brain data. I mean, you point to a lot of different types of information technology. Software has a 50% deflation factor. 
The economist said there's no way we would actually double our consumption of information technology every year. We might buy a little bit more. Actually, what we find is we more than double it. We've had 18% growth in constant dollars in information technology for the last 50 years, more than keeping pace with this doubling of price performance. People didn't buy iPods for $10,000 10 years ago, which is what it would have cost. As the price performance reaches certain levels, uh, new applications open up. Uh, magnetic data storage, I just put this up here because this is not Moore's law. This is not shrinking transistors. It's sh shrinking magnetic spots. Different scientists, same progression. Biotechnology, it's very revolutionary. We're really going to be able to reprogram our own biology. We have tools now to actually reprogram our genes. We can turn genes off with RNA interference. We can add new genetic information with reliable new techniques that overcome some of the earlier problems of gene therapy. We can turn on and off enzymes. It costs $10 per base pair. In 1990, it's a penny today. The amount of genetic data, this slope on this log chart is, represents doubling every year. That's continued past the collection of the genome. Communication, I mean, I don't have time to describe this in detail, but there's 50 different ways to measure it, wired, wireless, number of bits, number, amount of capacity, bandwidth, uh, all basically doubling every year. So if we have enough data, we can see the ripples of S-curves. I had a little bit of this chart of the Internet called then the ARPANET in the 1980s and predicted in my book, Age of Intelligent Machines, which I wrote 20 years ago, uh, that there would be a worldwide communication network comprising you know, tens of millions of people emerging in the mid-1990s. That seemed absurd at that time because it was, it was uh, 10,000 nodes doubling to 20,000 used by a few thousand scientists. Uh, and if you looked at it in a linear graph, this is what that same data looks like. And then in the early 90s, people said, well, you know, you, your projection is only a few years from now and it's still nothing is happening. But when you're doubling these little numbers, nothing is happening. Uh, even though a Exponential is smooth, no discontinuities. It ultimately becomes explosive. And by the mid-1990s, the Internet did take off. Uh, we're shrinking technology at an exponential rate, according to my models, a factor of 100 per 3D volume per decade, both electronic and mechanical. I don't want to dwell on this, but these are some projections from Eric Drexler's uh, seminal book, which I just got a signed copy of, and it's got a prominent place in my office, uh, Nanosystems from 1986. Uh, but I give hundreds of examples in my book of working nanosystems. This is not speculative anymore. Uh, there was speculation uh, when, at the age of at the Spiritual Machines Conference. Uh, one scientist created a little robot that walks with a convincing gait at the molecular level that looks like a human gait. Uh, another scientist built a device which you put thousands of them in the bloodstream of animals of rats and cures type 1 diabetes, has seven nanometer pores, lets insulin out in a controlled fashion, blocks antibodies because type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disorder. Uh, the idea of blood cell sized devices performing sophisticated therapeutic functions might sound very futuristic. There are four major conferences on biomems to do exactly that. At MIT and at the University of Rochester, there's a tiny nano device that can detect the specific antigens on the surface of a particular type of cancer cell latch onto the cell, burrow into the cell, detect that it's inside the cell, release toxins, and destroy the cell. And those sequence of four or five steps uh, of these nano-engineered systems has been demonstrated uh, in vitro, and it's going into animal trials. Uh, and that's today. And if you then contemplate multiplying the power of these technologies by a billion in 25 years, which is what this doubling every year amounts to, actually that would be 30 years, but it's actually a little faster than that, uh, while we shrink the size of these technologies by a factor of 100,000 in 25 years, and look at what we can do already, you get some idea of what will be feasible by the late 2020s. Uh, this is an animation of a robotic red blood cell. Red blood cells is a biological system we've reverse engineered. We understand them. They're not that complex. And it does bring up an issue about biology that it's very intricate, but it's also very suboptimal. And when we can re-engineer these systems, we can make them much more capable. A conservative analysis of these robotic respirocytes that Rob Friedis has designed indicates you could do an Olympic sprint in 15 minutes without taking a breath if you use these or sit at the bottom of your pool for four hours. Uh, so honey, I'm in the pool will take on a whole new significance. Uh, he's designed a robotic white blood cell. Uh, I don't have time to describe all these, but uh, if you look at what's already happening, there are some very sophisticated nanosystems that are being demonstrated. Uh, now, 
really understanding the principles of operation of the human brain has been difficult. You can't, up until recently, you can't do that with fMRI, getting, getting fuzzy pictures of seeing you know, where there's activity when you do certain types of thoughts or mental activity. Uh, but we're doubling the spatial resolution of brain scanning every year. I describe a number of new scanning technologies uh, in the book. One at the University of Pennsylvania allows you to see for the first time interneural connections, see them signaling in real time in, in a living brain. And we're getting the data uh, to actually begin to understand how the brain creates our thoughts. Uh, but my, my uh, proposal is not just to Un reverse engineer the human brain and sort of thoughtlessly uh, just put those algorithms on a suitable uh, computational substrate. We have a, an existing AI toolkit. It's increasingly powerful. We're doing things today that were impossible even seven years ago. Uh, we're just beginning to get hints from brain reverse engineering. When we got data on the front end, transformations of auditory data, uh, uh, on, from the auditory cortex. We put that into our speech recognition, got dramatically better performance. Uh, it was actually counterintuitive. These, these transformations are not what we would have predicted. But at, when, after we got them, we saw why those transformations are being made. And so we got that, that hint or that set of principles from having reverse engineered the auditory cortex or that portion of it. Uh, and that, be, that was very helpful in this uh, particular narrow AI application. So we're going to expand the AI toolkit from ongoing AI research. We'll have hints and ideas and models coming from reverse engineering the human brain. Uh, we will study the performance of the human brain itself. One good laboratory for that is studying human language, which does manifest all the hierarchical symbolic uh, types of structures that human thought is able to deal with. Um, in fact, Turing based his Turing test on uh, human language. Uh, brain scanning is growing exponentially in resolution, and uh, the amount of data is doubling every year on the brain. Uh, and Doug Hofstadter has posed the question, well, are we smart enough to understand our own intelligence? And, uh, you know, are we above or below that threshold? Clearly, a giraffe's brain, uh, Doug points out, is below that threshold. Maybe we were also below that threshold. Our ability to reverse engineer and model already 20 regions out of the several hundred regions that exist of the brain uh, and the fact that we can create technology, I believe, puts us over that threshold. Uh, this is a uh, model uh, and a detailed mathematical model and computer simulation of, of 12 different regions of the auditory cortex. Uh, and then applying sophisticated psychoacoustic tests to the simulation gets very similar results to applying those tests to human auditory perception. Doesn't prove that the model is uh, totally accurate, but uh, it does show that uh, we are capable of understanding uh, the principles of operation, expressing them in the language of mathematics. And if we can do that, we can simulate them on suitable computational platforms. And the number of regions that's being simulated is expanding. We have a simulation of the cerebellum. And then applying skill formation tests to the, to the simulation gets very similar results as applying those uh, tests to human uh, skill formation. The cerebellum is an important region. comprises more than half the neurons of the brain. And I'll come back to the significance of the cerebellum in a, in a moment, because it does give us a good insight as to what the complexity of the brain is. Now, this number of ways in which the brain is really quite different uh, from computers, and people often cite that, saying, well, computers can't simulate the human brain because it's massively parallel, it uses analog uh, computing, uh, it uses holographic forms of storage, uh, there are very few cycles available to make decisions. It's self-organizing. But these are actually very good principles which we are beginning to utilize. And as we learn more about how these self-organizing principles work, uh, we are incorporating them into uh, modern AI programs, particularly pattern recognition. We use these self-organizing paradigms. And as we learn more about how the brain does its own self-organization, it gives us powerful uh, insights and paradigms to apply to those pattern recognition methods.